Congressman. H- how are you? It's good to, good to speak with you and good to meet with you via phone. Yeah, thank you very Thank you for having me on today. It's, uh, you know, it's been a very interesting uh, few days here in Washington. And, and, and even though it happened outside of Washington, the court date that Hunter Biden had yesterday in Delaware is uh, – as a lawyer, and I'm a former federal prosecutor, it was interesting to watch and see that play out and see it unravel. And um, I, I take a little bit of satisfaction in that I'm on the House Ways and Means Committee. And earlier this year, our chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, Jason Smith from Missouri, had set up a whistleblower process within within the IRS so that IRS employees or agents could report fraud or abuse or uh, misuse, what have you. And, of course, you had these two IRS agents that came forward as a result of, of this whistleblower process to talk about what they perceived to be the unfair or, or disparate treatment that Hunter Biden was receiving compared to other people that they might investigate. Well, I think you're a good person to talk to about this, considering your former your your history within the court and within courtrooms. Um, I was so appreciative of the judge in this case who recognized uh, that this was a unique set of circumstances that were so highly unusual. She put a pause on this plea deal, particularly considering that the prosecution and the defense did not seem to be able to come together with what exactly. They had agreed to it, and I think it was the all parties in the case trying to have it a little both ways. They wanted to prevent any future um, charges being brought down on Hunter Biden. They wanted to stop all future inquiry. At the same time, they refused to say that the investigation was closed, and I think the judge properly in the case noted, well, you, you can't have this both ways. You can't have an open investigation and ask me to provide immunity uh, in the case that we might see other charges come up. What what do you say about it, Dave? Yeah, so it, it's interesting, Matt. Uh, first of all, if I, can, if I can rewind the clock two or three days, because as a result of these two whistleblowers, the, the IRS agents, the supervisory agent, and the agent who worked underneath him, again, blowing the whistle and talking about the, um, the their investigation of Hunter Biden and how, it, how they perceived it should have been how it should have gone forward and the fact that they were stymied at different levels from within the Department of Justice, they had to come forward to our committee, the Ways and Means Committee, and they gave what a lot of listeners would would know as depositions. They're called something else in the in the committee, but they essentially gave statements to the to the Republican lawyers and the Democrat lawyers on the committee. And what we what we tried to do was to have those uh, those statements admitted as part of the court record. And so when we filed on let's see this happened on Wednesday, so when we filed on Tuesday, two days ago, for them to be part of the court record, um, we did it, it was allowed, and there was somebody who called the court clerk's office in Delaware and they purported to be uh working for the staff of the Ways and Means Committee or the lawyer for the for the Ways and Means Committee, saying that, that in fact, these documents that had been admitted needed to be taken down or redacted or, or whatever. They misrepresented themselves to the, to the court personnel. And the judge, when she found out, the district court judge in Delaware, when she found out about this, was furious. And she entered a, a, a statement, an order, on Tuesday that said that Hunter Biden's lawyers – needed to to file something by nine o'clock that night, Tuesday night, or they could be they could be sanctioned. I mean, you don't see a judge that often say file something by nine o'clock tonight. And and so I, I think that that set the stage. Those filings and the and and it turned out that this person ended up being an employee for Hunter Biden's lawyers that set the stage for the um for the tone and, and ultimately what happened in court on Wednesday. Well, and I don't know that the judge ever got a chance to directly address that component. Now, obviously, there was a lot of other things to address. Have you ever heard right. anything uh, of anything like that in your time in Washington or in, in your time in a courtroom where 
opposing counsel, someone in their office calls to stop this. I mean, it's no. it's a fascinating development that would seem to be it would show a dramatic hubris or a naivete to how the how how all of this works to think that they thought they could get away with this. Well, it, it's just absolutely wrong. I mean, you you don't do that to a judge and you don't do that to the court clerk personnel. So the fact that she said on Tuesday you need to respond by nine o'clock tonight or I'm gonna I'm gonna sanction you lawyers, uh that that's pretty serious. But I but I also think to your question that she did a did a really good job analyzing this plea agreement and and recognize and I think everybody who's listening can appreciate this when the prosecutors and defense attorneys, whether they're in state court in Tennessee or federal court in Tennessee or wherever, come up with a, a plea agreement, the overwhelming majority of the time, the judge accepts the plea deal. You know, they the judge recognizes sure. that, that both sides have tried to work out what they think is right and fair and the justice is, is served. The fact that this judge looked at it and maybe in part because of these transcripts that were filed and said, number one, I don't know if it's quite right, and two, I don't know that I've got the authority to issue absolute immunity uh, for for crimes that may still be uh, investigated per the, the statement of the United States Attorney in, in Delaware. She did the absolute right thing by – by putting a, a pause on it and, and maybe suggesting that she can't accept the deal, uh, and so and so at this point now, uh, the, the the government and Hunter Biden's lawyers need to need to see if they can restructure it. I tell you though, from going backwards though, from my standpoint, knowing what I know as a lawyer, knowing what I know that's come before the Ways and Means Committee, what these two agents said is essentially. Same facts, same circumstances. If we're investigating Matt Murphy or David Kustoff or Joe Smith or Jane Jones, we're, we're the the punishment and the consequences are going to be a lot more severe than if we're investigating Hunter Biden. That should really send chills down everybody's back. Well, and I believe the immunity piece was designed to prevent any further investigation or conversation about Burisma, Ukraine. Russian side deals, Chinese side deals. We want to shut all of these things down before they get to a criminal court or, in my mind, more importantly, that information gets to you in the House of Representatives where you will be asked to consider articles of impeachment. Kevin McCarthy, the Speaker of the House, David, uh, spoke to this yesterday, and I'm curious your thoughts as the 8th Congressional District Representative of Tennessee. are. Do you believe we've gotten to the point where there needs to be some Strong consideration for articles of impeachment against Joe Biden. Yeah, I think we're I think we're awfully close uh, for uh, for at least for the impeachment inquiry. And you know the the thing is uh, he he meaning Joe Biden has dodged these uh, these questions from reporters. We've seen his press secretary dodge the questions, and you know whenever Biden President Biden that is is asked about it, he says he's proud of his son. He is proud of Hunter Biden. And I'm really concerned. I, I I look at the way that the Department of Justice has handled it, and I don't take any – let me say this. Again, as a former United States attorney, I don't take any pleasure in saying that, uh, that it looks like that there's almost a two-tiered system of justice depending on who you are or who you know. And it, it – bothers me. I think it certainly bothers my constituents. It should bother everybody who who's listening. We want to we want to have faith in our justice system. We want to have faith in the prosecutors and in the investigators. And when we when we lose that, then we see then we see a breakdown. And and in order for everything to be restored, uh, I certainly didn't want to see that plea agreement uh, approved yesterday by the judge. And I'm glad that she didn't. Do you um I should have asked you this before the conversation David do you do you have a couple of extra minutes I've got to do a couple sure. of advertisements I, I want to keep yep. you on because I want to talk about some of the issues affecting the 8th congressional district and all of Tennessee and all of America like southern border security and a lack thereof fentanyl and 
human and child smuggling, particularly. Our guest is David Kustoff, a great first conversation with the 8th Congressional District Representative, representing really all areas, um, n- non-Memphis areas, to our west uh, up until uh, just before you get to Dixon. I mean, you know where the 8th District is. 23 after the hour, Super Talk 99.7 WTN. Bud Light's profit numbers are well, light. Those stories and more coming up. 2.30, Super Talk 99.7 WTN. Thank you much, Mac Morty. I have a, a story involving that tease that I'll share with you after the bottom of the hour as well. Um, I think there has to be a rebranding going on in the future. We'll talk about that coming up in just a couple of minutes. Right now, our conversation with Congressman David Kustoff continues. Uh, he's joining us on the Matt Murphy Hotline on Super Talk 99.7 WTN. Um, outside of the issues surrounding Joe Biden and the possibility of an impending impeachment proceeding and inquiry, um, I, I feel like, I, well, I don't want to lead you in any particular way, but um, the border security crisis is causing so much more uh, in the state of Tennessee and in every state in the union. Is, is that number one on your radar screen, uh, Congressman, or is there something else that concerns you even more so than the, the fentanyl and the human and child trafficking that goes along with an open and porous border? Yeah, well, uh, both. As, as a matter of fact, um, uh, as, as far as the fentanyl is concerned, think about this. And I, we may have law enforcement that's listening. You know, the smallest amount of fentanyl is enough to kill you. And there's enough fentanyl in this nation right now to kill every one of us, every single American citizen, several times over. I mean, it, it is it's truly frightening. That fentanyl is coming through the United States, the majority of it, through the southern border. There's no dispute about this. Here's a statistic, man, if you will. In this fiscal year, there have been over 22,000 pounds of fentanyl that's been seized at the border by Customs and Border Control. That's great. The question is, we don't know what's gotten in that's gotten past uh, our Border Control officials. I think they do a great job. The the fact of the matter is there there's not enough of them and there's not enough of wall. There's not enough of the wall. Uh, you know, it's one thing we've all seen the images from the border and you read about it and I know you talk about it on your show. So I've been to the border under President Trump. I've been to the border under President Biden. It's gotten a lot worse under Biden than it was under Trump. And I, I want to give you I want to give you one example because when I talk about the border wall, um, I, I think you've seen these images of these steel beams that go up about 20 feet in the air. Do you, you've seen that. That's that's the wall. Right. And you can walk along. And by the way, it, in portions of it, it's embedded with technology that helps our border control officials. So you can walk along the wall and the wall will just stop. So it's not an issue of trying to dig underneath the wall or climb over it. You can walk around it. So when I was at the border under Biden, I was at a, I was in New Mexico, Sumlin, New Mexico, and it's a place where the wall just stops. Now I'm there and I'm looking, and next to the wall there are these steel beams, but instead of being in the ground, up in the air, in the ground. 20 feet high, they're in stacks laying on the ground. So I asked one of the supervisors there, one of the border control supervisors, I said, ma'am, what am I, what am I looking at? And she, her response to me was, this is the wall, but the order to stop construction was given after President Biden became president. So it's infuriating because that I voted, I voted your money, your taxpayer money, to build the wall for the materials and for the construction. And it's sitting out there in the desert, not of any use to anybody. So well, going, a, yeah, going fallow, basically, because no one will use it. And eventually, it will be determined that those materials can't be used for future uh, construction, sadly. D- David, I'm sorry to do it, but uh, we time constraints... Uh, precludes me from continuing the conversation, but this is a great opening conversation. Let's continue and, and uh, continue to inform the people of Middle Tennessee about what you're doing over uh, on the western side and, and vice versa. I, I so appreciate um, getting to meet you via phone, and, and let's do it again very soon, okay? 
Thank you, Matt. Thank you for having me on today. Uh, There's uh, Congressman David Kustoff of the 8th Congressional District. He uh, uh, His office called us up and said, hey, we'd love to talk to Middle Tennessee, and I love having him.